okay all right good morning everybody i hope you you are still interested in continuing the course <laughs> so what i thought uh, we'll do is um, i'm going to compress some of the sessions like uh, today we'll first i'll give the introduction about abc transporters in health and disease not only cancer but other diseases then we're going to move on to the multi drug resistance cancer problem and then roll up abc transporters in multi drug resistance after that i'll also uh, complete today we will do the mechanism of polyspecificity okay so that will allow us tomorrow then both the sessions to deal with mechanism of drug transporters so we can then do the secondary transporters as well as abc transporters and if we have time tomorrow we'll have the tutorial about the fda regulations and drug drug interactions so if some of you are doing that kind of work or on the modulators maybe we could have presentations if that is okay how many of you are directly working on modulators or natural product or in yeah uh, or transporters or anything related to what we are discussing so you would would you like to tell us what you do tomorrow afternoon because you know the fda regulations really i can give you the pdf and you can read and if there are any questions we can discuss i think you already gave them the pdf right the of the lee zhang uh, article from the fda do you have that or we can give you the pdf yes i will check what i thought i'll give you first the overview of abc transporters what are these and then we'll go to the next step so this is the atp binding cassette transporter super family this is one of the largest family of transporters known there are more than 1100 members have been identified and they you know range from bacteria to man the functional i will see this uh, unit is comprised of two atp binding cassettes and 12 transmembrane spanning helices which are formed either as a single polypeptide chain or as separate um, monomers which come together as dimers and as you can see the transported substrates include you know wide variety of ions sugars uric acid glycans phospholipids cholesterol peptides proteins toxins antibiotics and hydrophobic natural product anti cancer drugs so it's a wide range in human genome there are 48 uh, transport proteins or genes encoding these proteins and at least there are 15 genetic disease conditions associated with defects in 20 members of this family so it's not only restricted to the multi drug resistance but abc transporters actually have um, a role you know in many diseases as you will see and of these 20 members at least 12 members of this family are involved in transport of amphipathic compounds including anti cancer drugs and which some of them would contribute to resistance of cancer cells to chemotherapy so we'll come to that so if you look at the basic organization of these transporters you will see there is a transmembrane domain and an atp binding cassette domain okay in bacteria you can have as many as four genes coding for these so you will have two genes coding transmembrane domains two genes coding atp binding domain or there will be one gene coding six transmembrane helices one atp binding site so you have as many as four genes coding these domains or single gene as we will see in mammalian cells single gene will code for you know entire 12 transmembrane helices two atp binding sites and in some cases also regulatory domain or r domain although in most cases you have the orientation where you have the transmembrane helices followed by atp binding site in some cases you will see that there is a first the atp binding cassette followed by six transmembrane helices so the organization of domains is switched but as you will see in the crystal structure it doesn't make any difference whether you have the protein in this orientation or this orientation and in some cases in addition to this you you have another extra domain on the n terminal half 
these are five transmembrane helices and that's in some proteins you will see but we don't know yet what the function of this is in bacteria as we were discussing yesterday these atp binding cassette transporters actually function both to bring in the sugars or you know amino acids and other thing ions and these are called type 1 importer type 2 importer these are based on extra stores structural domains like you can see here there is a regulatory this green domain as well as on this side in importers you have a substrate binding protein separate unit which is missing in all mammalian systems because the ions or sugars in medium when where the bacteria grow are very limiting and these binding proteins act as scavengers so they have very high affinity for these ions or sugars and then we'll see how they bring it to the and this is the transmembrane region and the nucleotide binding domain so you have two types of importers and they also have the exporter some of these the msba or sav 1866 actually they transport lipid a or drugs antibiotics so they are similar they can be treated as functional homologs of human proteins so this is just to give you an idea about how the importers work in bacteria because the first studies on ABC transporters were done on bacterial systems. Histidine permease was the first whole system which was sequenced and cloned in 70s and then we actually purified reconstituted in uh, late 80s. So you have as we said substrate binding domain, two transmembrane domains in the membrane and two ATP sites. So the substrate binding actually the substrate binds amino acid or you know sugar and then it docks onto the transporter. Once it docks, that's when the signal is transmitted to the ATP binding sites to hydrolyze ATP. Till that time, there is no hydrolysis going on. So it's very tightly coupled. Once ATP hydrolysis starts, you have conformational change releasing the substrate binding domain. Then you also release the, your substrate as well as ADP phosphate. And you bring and then you repeat the cycle. Okay. But in mammalian systems, for example, peak glycoprotein, what you have is six transmembrane helices, ATP binding site, six transmembrane helices, ATP binding site. This is entirely encoded by a single polypeptide chain. So you do not have multiple um, genes or, you know, homo do domains or anything. If you have any questions, just feel free to interrupt me okay and we'll come to this um, again in the next session so why these are you know how are these classified as ATP binding cassette dom uh, transporters and the reason is all of them have this ATP binding cassette and some of these domains are similar to other ATP ages but there are distinguishing features for ABC transporters so Walker A and Walker B are motifs which were discovered by John Walker who got a Nobel Prize for mitochondrial ATPase structure. Those are common for other ATPases whereas the signature region C, Q loop, D loop and H loop, they are hallmark of ABC transporters. Okay. And how they are arranged, as I said, we need to have two ATP binding domains. Interestingly, each ATP binding domain does not work by itself. So you have, as you can see here, the functional ATP binding site is formed by Walker AB from the NBD1, okay, this half uh, circle, and the signature sequence and D loop comes from the NBD2. So you have a composite ATP functional site, although you have two independent ATP sites. So if you make a mutation in one of these sites, the protein doesn't work. You have to have both ATP sites functional, otherwise you don't get transport. And this is again shown schemat uh, schematically how ATP interacts with different residues. As you can see, this is more like um, upside down. In one side, you have the ATP where adenine, you know, the residues 
which bind in NBD1 are on top, whereas on the other side, you know, you have from the bottom, this one. And so, you have the A loop, Walker A, or Q loop, Walker B of NBD1, and the D loop and C region, which is from the NBD2. And so, the ATP is actually sandwiched between the both ATP sites. Okay? So, if you have some modulator which can prevent entry of the ATP into these binding sites, that can be a target for treatment. And this signature region has 12 amino acids which are unique to only ABC transporter proteins. And these are classified. So, I also told you this organization of the domains is not really the same like where you have the transmembrane domain followed by ATP binding site, but in some cases you have first the ATP binding site, then six transmembrane helices, ATP binding site, six transmembrane helices. So this is a full transporter from yeast or candida albicans, which also is involved in fun fungal drug resistance. And these can be considered as functional orthologs of human transporters. But interestingly, Unlike most of the ABC transporters in humans, this sequence of NBD1 and NBD2 is quite different. We, the NBD2, we call it canonical, which means well conserved and with fully functional, whereas the NBD1 is deviant site. You can see some of the residues being different, like the lysine, cysteine, uh, gl glutamate versus aspergine so and so forth. So, interestingly, evolutionarily, only the NBD1 shows this deviant site in all other transporters, also like ABC, B11, or TAP1, TAP2, MRP, CFTR. And it's not yet clear why only the NBD1 is deviant and not the NBD2, evolutionarily. And by looking at all these sequences, then, you know, the human genome, um, once we knew that there are 48 transporters, it's been classified, as you can see, this classification is based on the sequence of the ATP binding sites. So this is the ABCC family, which is the MRP family, where you have the extra domain on N-terminal half. This is with MRP1, 3, 5, um, 3, 6, 7, whereas MRP4 and 5 is similar to uh, you have like p glycoprotein. So you can see there is a combination of different domains. But two, there are two families like ABCE and ABCF which only have ATP domains. There are no transmembrane regions. So they actually do not function by themselves as transporters. Because to be a transporter, you need to have a membrane component. Without that, you cannot consider that as a transporter. So these may be functioning as regulatory proteins. And so the most important for the drug resistance are this ABCB subfamily, ABCC, and then the ABCG, where have, you have this, the reverse domain organization and the half transporter. As you can see, there are only six transmembrane helices and one ATP binding site. You do not have a full transporter in ABCG family. But when you look at the function, you will see that you need to have homodimer of this to be functional. Uh, so, for func the functional unit of ABC transporters is always the two transmembrane domains and two ATP sites. Either you can have a genetic dimer or you can have a physical dimer. Okay? So, there are many diseases where uh, the ABC transporters are associated. We will go into detail about the cancer, the drug resistance, where the difference is that here you have uh, overexpression of transporters. It's not that there, is, there are mutations in the genes, whereas the other diseases like cystic fibrosis, there is a mutation or multiple mutations in the CFTR protein. Again, you have the gout. In this case, the mutation in ABCG2 is linked to gout. Stargard, this is an age-related uh, macular uh, degeneration, which where, you know, um, older people get retinal detachment, and that's because of the mutations in this ABCA4 
uh, transporter. There are also people on tang Tangier disease and family lace deal where they have defect in cholesterol metabolism and levels of cholesterol. Then you have progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis where the liver specific ABC B11 and ABC B4 transporters have mutations. And when you continue this, you also have the Dubin Johnson syndrome with MRP2. Uh, some people also have the pseudoxanthomyelasticum, which is a connective tissue disease linked to ABC C6 or MRP6. And the persistent hypoglycemia of infancy or neonatal diabetes, there are two ABC transporters, actually these proteins which do not really transport anything but they regulate ATP dependent potassium channels in pancreas and that's how they are involved in neonatal diabetes. And then we have the iron based sidero, um, sideroblastic anemia or ataxia, ABC7. Uh, you must have heard about Lorenzo's oil that's one of the movies came out and that's adrenal leukodystrophy where that long chain fatty acids get accumulated in paroxysms. That's also a genetic disease where this LD or uh, ABCD1 is uh, involved. And then plant sterols which we actually absorb. Some of the people have the de um, defect and that's a cytosterolemia uh, which is uh, associated with ABCG5, G8 mutations. And important also when you have viral infections and you develop immun immunity, the peptides which are presented to the um, T cells for removing actually are given by this transporter TAP1 and TAP2 are involved in the antigen presentation and we'll see that how that happens. So as you can see the wide range of diseases where uh, these ABC transporters are involved. And we, as I said earlier, there are 12 to 14 transporters which transport drugs and these are some of the, you know, you can have the list from, uh, you'll have the, I will, you know, these slides as PDF so you can go through all these, uh, but you can see the wide range of substrates and also the location of these transporters depending on their function. And these are the main three transporters. ABC, B1, uh, C1, or MRP, uh, and some of the other members, and the ABC, G20. This is just, again, re-emphasizing the domain organization where, you know, you can have different variations. So now, you, if you see, we are all, you know, talking about the broad specificity, but also there are overlapping substrate specificities. As you can see here, clearly, some of the anti-cancer drugs, antracyclines, vinca alkaloids, uh, VP16, methotrexate, camptothecins, paclitaxel, and number of transporters actually can transport these. So there's not a single specific, except like you can see the nucleoside analogs are transported only by MRP4 or MRP5. Okay. So these are the locations of most of the transporters you can see. We, we yesterday discussed the brain, blood-brain barrier, and some of them are shown, the PGP, ABC, G2, MRP4 is there. We'll also go into detail this, uh, the adrenal gland, this is ABC, G2 also present here, kidney, epithelial cells. You also have the placenta barrier, intestine, uh, testis, uh, blood barrier. And in liver, as we discussed yesterday, you have a number of ABC transporters which are on the canalicular membrane. And when you have defects in these, you also develop these polarity disorders. That means the hepatocytes do not polarize and give you this canalicular membrane and the basolateral membranes. And these are the some of the disease conditions, you know, you have this inherited liver disorders include, transporters include ABC B11 or BCEP, B ABC B4 and ABC C2, and basolateral, you have the OATP 1B1, 1B3 linked to rotor syndrome. So these are genetically linked diseases. And now the blood brain barrier, as you can see in our brain, this is a human brain with the capillary network 
and the capillary net network in adult human brain is estimated to have 375, almost 400 miles of the whole network out there. So how complicated this is and the extensive blood um, network. And here this is just showing the, um, you know, the endothelial, the capillary astrocytes and their uh, interactions. And this is the showing two endothelial cells with the, um, you know, the gap junction. And this is the blood side, this is the brain side. And as you can see, number of ABC transporters are expressed on the endothelial apical surface or luminal surface, which pump out the drugs. Um, we yesterday, you know, looked at the use of rat brain capillaries to study and this is more expanded version of that system. So it's surprising not many people recognize, but atherosclerosis as well as the lipid cholesterol linked diseases, there are many ABC transporters involved. And as you can see, the ABC A1, which is involved in cholesterol efflux, ABC A2, lipid homeostasis. And I told you about the ABC A4, which is present in specifically only in retina, which transports this N-retinyl, then uh, possibly ethanolamine lipid, uh, ABC A7, B4, phosphatidyl choline transport. And the BCF is involved in transporting biliary cholesterol and phospholipids. Uh, ALD1, the Lorenzo's oil, which is you know, specific for long chain fatty acid transport in paroxysms. Some of these paroxysmal fatty acid homeostasis, oxysterol and plant sterols. So they do have an important role in lipid homeostasis. And that's why now people, you know, cardiovascular diseases, uh, many of the workers are focusing on these transporters to see their role in cardiovascular diseases. So I thought I'll do, just give you a snapshot of a couple of diseases because you know these studies are going on like last 30 years. And this is not the problem for Indian population, but in Caucasian population, as you can see. Um, so this CFTR is the only ABC transporter which does, does not function as transporter, but it functions as a channel for chloride ions. And it's mostly present in lung. So you have the, which moves the chloride and sodium movement in and out of epithelial cells in lungs and other organs. And one of the criteria or for the cystic fibrosis is that the patients have very thick mucus in the lung, bronchial uh, area, and they have a high incidence of then bacterial infections. So we will come to this uh, regulatory domain, R domain, which when it's phosphorylated by protein kinases, it regulates the function of the chloride channel. And this is the most common genetic disorder in populations of northern European descent, affecting one out of every 2,500 newborns. Okay? And quite a number of people have this heterozygous alleles. And although they don't show the symptoms, then their progeny actually uh, shows this being that this is diagnosed in very early stages in life, uh, childhood. And if it, earlier, like 20 years ago, they were not surviving more than age of 20. But now because of therapeutic intervention, people can live almost as up to the age of 45, 50, and in some cases 60. As you'll see, 70 percent of CF patients have a single amino acid deletion which is a phenylalanine 508 and this interestingly results in retention of this transporter or channel in endoplasmic reticulum. Normally it is present on surface. So you'll see that this is a very common theme about the mutations in ABC transporters which lead to genetic condition. What happens is the protein because of the mutation is not folded properly in endoplasmic reticulum and it does not then transport to the cell surface. But if you now have a therapeutic intervention and you bring that protein to plasma membrane, now it's fully functional. So that's one of the therapeutic treatment for cystic fibrosis and we'll come to that. How they are starting that mutation? What's that? How they are starting that mutation to bring that 
So what happens is when the, they, they, they use these pharmacological chaperones and when the chaperone binds, somehow it allows the protein to fold. So when you have these mutations, there are um, heat shock proteins. These are chaperone proteins which tightly bind to the mutated protein. Then when you add a pharmacological chaperone, even simple like glycerol or, uh, you know, some of the others that people use like cyclosporine, that actually dissociates the heat shock proteins from the mutated protein and then allows it to refold. And this all happens in endoplasmic reticulum. All these defects, only the proteins get retained in endoplasmic reticulum. Once you bring that protein from endoplasmic reticulum to Golgi onwards, then it normal trafficking. So in this one, only that folding is exactly. And when you have continuous misfolded protein in ER, it gets directed to proteosomes and then gets degraded. So you, that's the pathway, okay? So there is a, because this is a disease linked to, you know, the in, uh, mostly Caucasian population, there is a, about 40 years ago, they formed the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, uh, which is very actively involved in supporting research. So th in 30 years ago, they made a decision to support a company, Vertex, which is on uh, West Coast. And that company actually now developed this Evac Cap Factor uh, and also Oracambi. These are now in the clinic, in the use of clinic for treating patients. And what they do is they allow the misfolded protein to be brought to the cell surface. So the patients now are, you know, recovering. They have the improved function. And some, there are other mutations where there is a, although it comes to the plasma membrane, it doesn't function properly, so they are called potentiators. So this company actually, you know, now made almost four to five billion dollars. And so because the foundation f supported it, they made almost three to four billion dollars. So that's the richest foundation of cystic fibrosis, because of which they're also actually supporting the research on a other ABC transporters. Because, uh, this misfolding phenomena is not restricted only to cystic fibrosis. We'll see also in P-glycoprotein, ABCG2, we have the same problem. And you can use the, exactly the same correctors which actually correct CFTR, this protein, and you can correct ABCG2 defect. Yeah. So this, actually this cystic fibrosis is turned over very rapidly for some reason. It's almost half-life is only 20 to 30 minutes at plasma membrane. Yes, and uh, there are a lot of trans transcription factors and regulators regulating cystic fibrosis protein, but not the drug resistance related protein. So those are much stable at cell surface, almost up to 25, 30 hours in cell lines. So this, this is the, the regulation of CFTR is very different from the other ABC transporters. And now, the, actually, this year only, we now have the structure, cryo-electron microscopy structure of human CFTR. And these are the transmembrane helices. This is the R domain. And, you know, these are the ATP binding uh, domains. So after, you know, so many years, now we have this. And now people have mapped different mutations on the different domains. And we can now understand more their mechanism. So this is what I was talking about, the cystic fibrosis modulators. Modulators targeting the delta 508 uh, mutation. Once it's in the endoplasmic reticulum, that characters C1 or C2, there's a long list of these which, you know, work. Yes. Yeah, that's why it's delta 508. If you have, if you create the same deletion in pig like a protein, you have the same phenotype. It gets uh, retained in ER. The other transporters also show the same thing. So this is currently actually what we have is this triple combination therapy for cystic fibrosis, you know, with the small molecule, or these are called pharmacological chaperones. The C1 type characters, C2 type characters, and the marketed drugs. 
So this is the most recent review, actually. You could, if you want, we, you know, I can share the PDF of this with you. Yes? So potentiators, as you can see, the location of potentiator is shown that it's a protein is already on the cell plasma membrane, whereas the correctors bring the protein from endoplasmic reticulum to the plasma membrane. Some mutations actually don't affect the trafficking, but they affect the function. And that's corrected by the potentials. Okay. Whereas here, all you are doing is bringing it to the cell surface. You're not correcting the function because the function is normal once you are, the protein comes to the cell surface. So uh, I was t uh, telling about the another important um, transporter. Uh, no, this is actually, again, just keep showing the schematic, uh, showing the synthesis of CFTR in endoplasmic reticulum. And as you can see, this is what I was explaining about the, how the misfolding is uh, prevented or, you know, you have this HSP, heat shock protein 90, and see the number of proteins which need to be interacting with the CFTR to, matu you know, to maturate it and then bring it to the cell surface. All these are more, you know, the ones which are shown in purple are the sort of the regulatory things. And then this misfolded protein, after binding so many proteins, is then degraded by ubiquitin proteasome pathway. So you need to catch this protein before it goes to proteasome to bring it to the cell surface. Otherwise, and then the reason it has a very short half-life at plasma membrane is because it's always recycled into the vesicles. And these vesicles, you know, remain near the plasma membrane. And when you have the, another signal, they are brought back to the plasma membrane. So it never comes back to or the ER, but it, some of it can also go to the lysosomes and get degraded, but mostly it's accumulated in cytoplasm. Okay. And this is just to show the comparison of the MR MRP1. This is SUR1, which is only involved in regulating ATP dependent potassium channel. And as you can see, some of these have similar structural features. And peak like a protein is quite different because we don't have these extra domains or the R domain. And this is just for the mechanistic aspects that or, you know, people study. And although MRP1, I'll, we'll see in the next session, there are some similarities and, diff and differences between how the glutathione conjugated anti cancer drug gets transported by MRP1 and how chloride gets transported by CFTR. But in the binding pocket, you have residues with positive charge. In this case, also, you have the hydrophobic residues. But in CFTR, these are all positively charged residues because chloride is a negatively charged, uh, it's anion. So another important um, transporter um, is this TAP1 and TAP2. So most of the time when you have a, uh, adaptive immunity, either the you know, misfolded proteins in the ER, uh, which are toxic peptides, or when the viral infection is there and the viral pep proteins get degraded, you generate peptides. And to bring, if these are foreign proteins, the cells need to develop immunity to do that and they need to be cleared. So the way these peptides are cleared is that you have the peptides which come, and this is the trans ABC transporter TAP1, TAP2, ABC, B2, B3, which is a part of the MHC class 1, which is the major histocompatibility um, complex 1. Uh, this is also called the peptide loading complex. Okay. So you can see in the endoplasmic reticulum, these are actually now loaded onto the MHC class 1, this black peptide is shown. Uh, these are get then trafficked to all the way to the plasma membrane. And this is, this happens in all cell types. You know, so TAP1, TAP2 is present in all cell types. And then the cytotoxic T cells actually, you know, recognize these peptides with the T cell receptor and get cleared. That's how we develop immunity. 
So any mutations in this TAP1, TAP2 will have the effect on development of the immunity. And actually it's much more complex. This is just the core transporter, TAP1, TAP2. But then you have all the stepesin and other molecules who are required for the peptide loading complex. And this is, I'm just showing you the most recent st crystal structure. So these last two or three years, we have a lot of structural information about these ABC transporters, which help to explain the biochemical and mutational data. Similarly, there are many ABC transporters also in mitochondria. And there are three of them which are involved in the, you know, the role, they have role in heme as well as the iron sulfur protein biosynthesis. ABC B6 is present on the outer membrane of the mitochondria, whereas ABC B7 and ABC B10 are present in the inner mitochondrial membrane. And if you have defect in any of these, they have a effect on heme biosynthesis as well as iron sulfur biosynthesis. So these are involved in the functional um, well-being of mitochondria and also providing, because you, iron sulfur proteins are very important for the electron transport chains uh, functioning and respiration, okay? So that's about the ABC transporters, transporters and uh, their role in general health and disease. So we just discussed about different diseases, so now we're focusing on cancer. Uh, this is just, I think, so if you look at the statistics of at least for the U.S. population, because that's the data I have available. I'm sure there is a cancer registry even in India, and you can find these numbers. Uh, more than almost, you know, 600,000 men and women would have the deaths due to the cancer this year. And as you can see, the number one uh, type of cancer is the lung and bronchus in both men and women. And then you have the breast or pr prostate, colon, rectum, colon, rectum, there's not much uh, gender difference. And in most cases, it's estimated that 50% deaths would be due to resistance to drugs when they are given uh, chemotherapy. And this is just a schematic showing you, you have the cancer where 50% of the patients at least have surgery and radiation, at least for solid tumors. Even after giving surgery or radiation therapy, patients are put on chemotherapy so that whatever is remaining cancer cells will not, you know, regrow. But there are almost half of the tumors which really cannot be treated with surgery or radiation. So the main <coughs> treatment is chemotherapy. And only in this, you can see 5 to 10 percent only get cured by chemotherapy. About 45 percent you have resistance. And so the major impediment to effective chemotherapy of cancer is the development of multidrug resistance. And the phenomenon of multidrug resistance is, as I'll show you, either intrinsic or acquired resistance to chemically different natural product anti-cancer drugs. Not only they are chemically different, but they also have different targets. They could be inhibiting DNA synthesis, they could be inhibiting protein synthesis, or they may be even inhibiting microtubule formation, which is important for cell shape, okay? And one of the, the main reasons, I'm, I'm sure most of you know why the DNA synthesis or protein synthesis is targeted in cancer cells. The reason, one of the reasons is these are the most fast growing cells and that's why you want to kill the fast growing cells by using these uh, methods. So the pro problem for most metastatic cancers, chemotherapy with classical or targeted anti-cancer drugs may result in remissions. As you've shown here, you have, you know, the, in let's say 1%, less than 1% cells, you will start getting intrinsic resistance because they have these transporters expressed. As you kill the rest of the cells, these cells keep grow, uh, re growing and then you get what is called acquired resistance. So you do have this phenomenon seen in clinic all the time where once the patient is given chemotherapy, initially you may have as much as 90, 95% reduction in size of tumor. 
but over a period of time it regrows. Now, recently, in addition to having this intrinsic resistance, so intrinsic means because, as we saw, these transporters are present on in most organs like colon, uh, breast, or liver. So if your cells in those organs actually become cancerous because they already have those proteins there, that's why it's called intrinsic. And when we say acquired is when you expose those cells to drugs, then you get their resistance. Now in addition, because the last 15 years we have these targeted therapies where you target one gene or one protein or specific, like say for example, tyrosine kinases, we'll come to that on Friday. Then those conditions like this amyloid leukemia or melanoma where you have this intrinsic resistance, then acquired resistance, but in addition to that, You'll also see that some of these, because of the mutations and other changes, other cells, you know, have different uh, chem properties than the acquired resistance. And this is called adaptive resistance. That means by using genetic means, the cells start adapting to the drugs, what are they exposed to. So you have intrinsic resistance, you have acquired resistance, and now another one feature which would be this adaptive resistance, okay? So obviously, you know, the res development of resistance is a complex problem. It's not, you know, just one mechanism for a given cell or anything. There are multiple mechanisms and that would, that is to be expected. So you have intracellular mechanisms which are shown here where you have reduced apoptosis, altered cell cycle, checkpoints or growth pathways, increase the metabolism of drugs, increased or altered targets, increased repair, you know, DNA damage repair, or some of the drugs get accumulated in vesicles or say vacuoles, and that's our lysosomes. That also can be one of the ways cells can develop resistance to the drugs. But the main observations are that Either there is a decreased uptake of drugs because you have, you know, uptake transporters with 52 families and 386 carriers. So maybe some of them have mutations which allows decreased uptake. But more than that, you also have this increased efflux by ABC transporters. Because for, you know, action of your drugs on a target in a cell, you need certain concentration of drugs in the cytoplasm, okay, without which it cannot reach the target. So all the flux transporters are really doing is keeping the drug concentration mini before the be below the threshold required to reach the target. And that's the really the main way mechanism how they actually contribute to the development of resistance to drugs. Because if your drug cannot reach the target, there's no way it can inhibit the target. So intracellular low concentrations of drugs is really the observation or effect of the efflux function of ABC transporters, okay? So what is the clinical significance of MDR? Uh, you can see that this is frequently observed in patients undergoing chemotherapy also observed in some type of tumors prior to chemotherapy because of intrinsic resistance. Then cross resistance to most commonly used natural product drugs. So as we were saying yesterday, if a ovarian cancer patient is given paclitaxel initially, but later on if they start developing resistance and you give doxorubicin, you'll, they will con still continue to have cross resistance because even though the cells never saw doxorubicin, but the transporters recognize it. And this is because of the development of MDR, you have poor prognosis. So there are, you know, tumors or cancers which have high levels of MDR at diagnosis. And this is to be expected. We just, I was telling you the reason being, these are the organs where you have these, you know, the higher 
expression of these transporters. And because of the higher expression, these tumor or the ty cancer types have high levels. Because to begin with, you have high expression of these transporters. But then, in some of these cases, as you can see here, they develop acquired resistance after treatment. So initially, there is low levels of MDR at diagnosis, but then you start developing more as you start treatment. And these include breast cancer, ovarian, sarcomas, and variety of the others. So just to give an example, as I was telling you earlier, depending on the stage of your cancer, what type of ABC transporters can be expressed. And this is a recent study showing, as you can see, the normal prostate. And when the pre-malignant state starts, these are the number of the ABC transporters which are overexpressed. Okay? Whereas ABC C3 is down-regulated. As you go to the early stages of prostate cancer, because of the decreased microRNAs, MIR1 or MIR 455, you get upregulation of ABC B6, upregulation of ABC C10 or MRP7, and then you have down regulation of C3. And this is because you have the MIR 13028 um, being upregulated, and this results in aggressive prostate cancer. So, as you can see, it will depend on the stage of cancer where you look at expression of ABC transporters. If you look at early stages, you may get a completely different picture than a late stage. So it's not necessarily that the same transporter will be overexpressed at all stages. And this is the real main um, thing to show you that this can happen. And not that many tumors people are looking at this, but we have to be aware that this is possible because the regulatory mechanisms are quite different. Okay. And this is the, you know, the dose of the type of treatment right now for prostate cancer, which is docetaxel. This is another kind of paclitaxel given by infusion, and these are possible resistance mechanisms. Either you can have, you know, aberrant angiogenesis because you have blood vessel developments. You can also have the increased drug efflux or because of the overexpression of transporters, then activated androgen receptors proliferative anti-apoptotic mechanisms, altered microenvironment, the extracellular, the ECM endothelial receptor, interaction of microtubules. So these are, you know, may various factors which one has to consider, and that's the structure of your docetaxel. So moving on to the, the major ABC transporters, so there is a almost body of almost 25 years of work on peak like protein. And this is a summary of that clinical work. So approximately 50% of human cancers express peak like a protein at level sufficient to confer drug resistance. Okay. And this is shown uh, experimentally. And as we were discussing earlier, the acquired, acquired expression of PGP following treatments of the patients include leukemias, myelomas, lymphomas, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and preliminary results with PGP inhibitors suggest improved response to chemotherapy in some patients, but not overall. And then cancers which express PGP at the time of diagnosis include colon, kidney, pancreas, and they do not respond to the PGP inhibitors. Now we have the animal models with human cancer xenografts, like BRCA1 driven mouse model where people are studying the mechanism of drug resistance. And the really the bottom line of these clinical studies so far is that PGP expression is sufficient to cause drug resistance, but may not be the sole factor for leading to drug resistance. Okay? So now we will look at some of the properties of this peak glycoprotein. Um, so as I was telling you, six transmembrane helices followed by ATP binding site, six transmembrane helices, ATP binding site. And these blue dots actually, what they show is the point mutations in the protein. You can see the several mutations everywhere in a protein, but it has no effect on transport function, but it will change the specificity. For example, 
if you have a glycine to valine mutation at 185, instead of transporting more of wind blasting, it will transport colchicine. So the protein gets phosphorylated by protein kinases in this linker region, poor phosphorylation sites or glycosylation on the extracellular loop. But by mut if you remove these by mutations, it is still functional. So you don't really need post translational modification of p glycoprotein and we don't know why it is there because it's normal function. And then what we do is, yes, as we talked yesterday about using affinity chromatography for purification, we use histag at carboxy terminal in the protein for purification and other things. Okay. And this is just showing you we have the structure of mouse p glycoprotein and the green transmembrane helices are from the end terminal half. And as you can see, there are four of them, and then two of them go to the other side, which is called interleaving. And then two from the cyan ones come from the C terminal half into the N terminal half. So you really don't have bundles of six and six, but there is a interleaving of the helices. Uh, and that's why it's very complex, why structurally this is, uh, you know, developed this way. And phosphorylation sites are in the linker region here. So these are, you know, the, there is a long list of substrates and modulators. So most of you are familiar with the modulator, definition of modulator, right? But there is a difference in the pharmacological def definition of modulator and from a transport point of view. So what you will find is that most of these modulators which are shown here actually are transported by p protein. So for a transport point of view, they really are transport substrates. But the way they modulate it, for example, you take cells which are growing in wind blasting. Now they are resistant to wind blasting. And if you now add wrap mill, what happens is wrap mill will compete for the binding site for the wind blasting and will not allow wind blasting to be transported but it gets accumulated in the cytoplasm and you kill the cell. And that's why the effect is modulatory effect. But from the mechanistic point of view, it is actually a transport substrate, okay? So you need to make this distinction very clear that even though we have a long list of modulators, they are not real actually modulators. For example, if you look at enzyme, kinetics, right? You have inhibitors, which are competitive inhibitors, you have non-competitive inhibitors, or also we call them dead-end inhibitors, which means your inhibitor will bind into the binding site where substrate bind, but it, would, it will not be removed. And we actually are looking for those kinds of modulators for transporters, and not those which get transported. Because if you have something like cyclosporine, which also will get transported by pig like a protein, which we can show are tyrosine kinase inhibitors like imatinib, nilotinib. These are actually in the clinic used as drugs for treating the leukemias. So you need to really keep this in mind, what is a modulator uh, from the transporter point of view and pharmacological definition. So in addition to these others, you also have cardiac glyc you know, glycides, uh, glycides and statins Statins are all transported by p glycoprotein. HIV protease inhibitors also, are mo which act as modulators, are transported. There are only two that we know which are not transported by p glycoprotein is disulfiram, which is used to treat alcoholism, or phytochemical curcumin, which does not appear to be transported by p glycoprotein. Okay? So these are all the compounds, but now recently people have found that environmental pollutants in seawater as well as fresh water. You have pesticides because the, you know, the waste water is actually dumped into rivers or in sea, ocean. There are high levels of organochlorine pesticides, polychlorinated biphenyls, and they get actually accumulated in fish, uh, mussel and other things, and they actually are the inhibitors of mammalian pig like a protein. So if you use any of these pesticides, uh, if you ingest they do have effect on your transporters. And now, you know, there is awareness that we need to look at 
the accumulation of these in fish, especially because you know fish are come consumed uh, in our diet, and you could have this effect. So, what what is the common feature in this? You know, all the different structures of substrates or modulators. As you can see, there is no single common feature. Only common feature is that it's um, amphipathic and hydrophobic, or some of them have positive charge at physiological pH. So most of these compounds which are recognized by pig glycoprotein are chemically dissimilar, except the properties that are hydrophobic or amphipathic. You can see the difference like in terichidar or curcumin or vinblastin, uh, even cyclic cyclosporinate. Yeah. yeah. Yes, oh, we'll come to that, yes. This is actually, we have went through that. And then you can see the long list of substrates which are transported by these three transporters. But if these three transporters are absent, you have other transporters which also can transport drugs. So that's one of the reasons we discussed yesterday about knockout mice. You know, when you have three transporters missing, they still have normal function. That's because other transporters can take over. So this is showing you the Venn diagram of or, you know, overlapping substrate specificity for different substrates for pig glycoprotein, MRP1, and ABCG2. So you do have some specific substrates like paclitaxel is mainly transported by B1 or PGP, colchicine verapamil, whereas all the anthracyclines are, you know, are mitoxantron, donorubicin, etoposide, these are all transported by three transporters. And that's one of the problem is that you have overlapping substrate specificity. So what you would like to have in a modulator which will actually inhibit all three of the transporters. Okay? Although they have overlapping substrate specificity, there is no common mechanism. Well, like we don't know what actually contributes to this overlapping substrate specificity. And this year we actually have the structures of all the three transporters. By so this is the mouse pig like a protein uh, MRP1. I showed you that this is the extra um, domain, the N terminal domain, and you can see there is not much difference. And then, although ABCG2 is homodimer, and as you can see here, you can't really make out differences because these are the two NBDs. And even though your organization was ATP binding site and six transmembrane helices which was other than opposite to pig glycoprotein, in this structure you can't really make out differences. So once you have the tertiary structure, but then how does the drug binding site form here compared to MRP1 or pig glycoprotein? That's what we need to study. So APO means actually there is no drug or ATP present. So if you have a drug present, it will be substrate bound complex. So your transporter has three states, right, or four. You will have the transporter without having ATP or substrate. Then it will have a substrate bound state. Then you have substrate plus ATP bound state. And then you have the release of ATP, I mean ADP and substrate. Then the cycle starts. It has to go through all those four stages to complete the cycle. Okay. So let's look at now the next topic, uh, which is the polyspecificity or broad substrate specificity. What are the factors actually contribute to polyspecificity of uh, most of these ABC transporters? Uh, but specifically, I will give you the examples using uh, pig like a protein, uh, maybe some of the ABC G2 or MRP1. Uh, you have the we just discussed this morning about chemical dissimilarity. Like you don't have any chemical features except the hydrophobicity or um, amphipacity. And then how we use the mutagenesis studies to look at the polyspecificity. And then biochemical studies showing at least having two or three substrate binding simultaneously to pig glycoprotein. Then structural studies with co-crystallization uh, and evidence for multiple sites for same substrate. 
and then what happens to the drug binding pocket when you make extensive changes by mutagenesis. So <coughs> just to uh, you know, give you an idea, uh, this is a mouse pig like protein structure which was co-crystallized with, there is a cyclic peptide inhibitor QZ compound which is, has the structure of this tripeptide and R group is either you have leucine, phenylalanine, these are amino acids, uh, or um, you have the valine, this is the original compound which was made and then except for changing this R group everything is normal and as you can see except when you change from valine to alanine, here you have three molecules binding to the <coughs> transporter. You have two here. When you have phenylalanine, you have two, but when you have leucine, there is one. So the same chemical entity almost, except for the R groups, you can have binding sites ranging from one to three. And how this actually comes to play. And the question really we are asking is, these are mouse structural studies uh, with mouse protein. Is this site a common binding site for human pig like a protein? Because we do not have the structure of human pig like a protein yet. So you need to have uh, what is called homology model of pig like a protein of human uh, pig like a protein based on mouse structure. And to have that justification why you can use mouse structure, you can see here the mouse and human gene, the amino acid sequence is highly conserved, like it's 87 percent identity or 94 percent similarity. The human protein is 1280 amino acids, the mouse protein is 1276 amino acids, there is a four amino acid difference. So you can see there are only 162 changes which are these silver balls you can see on the structure of the mouse and human uh, different in mouse compared to human. So the drug binding site residues, there are about 30 residues, amino acids, which are similar in mouse and human protein. And you can then use those for making changes. And that's just the, again, model with the bacterial sow structure uh, 1866, where you can see the identity is very low, 34%, 53% similarity. And that's why we use this mouse structure to build a homology model. And then ask a question. Okay, you have 30 amino acid residues in the drug binding site. If you mutate some of them by alone, like if you're just making a single substitution, for example, F728C, which means phenylalanine 728 to cysteine, or you can have two of them or three residues. So these are the transmembrane helices like 5, 6, 7, 11, and 12. We focused only on these five because they are in, they line the residues of the drug binding pocket. You can also make multiple combinations of these. And then you can first do the in silico methods as building the homology model, identifying the residues, and then selecting the residues for mutations. Then you make the mutations either in wild type or cysteine-less background, express them in insect cells. We looked at these um, procedures yesterday with ba using baclovirus. You can prepare membrane vesicles or you can purify the protein and then look at some of the activities. And then the same baclovirus you use to look at expression and transport studies. Okay. So yesterday we looked at the Prezosine is the substrate for pig like a protein. We can have a fluorescent molecule of prezosine, which is body P conjugated. As I said, some of the substrates have intrinsic fluorescence. Some of them you can conjugate with the probe. Here we conjugated with body P prezosine. And you can look at the, and then we also looked at yesterday this I125 labeled with azido group IAAP. So the body P prezosine, you can use to look at transport property of the wild type or the mutants. As you can see here, it shows that the transport of body P prezosine is similar with this triple mutant, almost 80% compared to uh, the wild type, okay? 
you can then use this photo affinity label to and also can be used to transport. So when you use these probes, you need to show that are these really the probes which are behaving as substrates. So if photo affinity probe is behaving as a substrate, then you expect that it will be pumped out by the transporter. And you can do these studies in dark where you don't, so long as you don't expose protein to UV, the IAP remains as a normal substrate. Only under UV, you change this azardo group to nitrines and then you cross link to protein. Till that time it binds to the binding site normally and you get, you can see the transport of the IAP because it's being pumped out, your accumulation is much less compared to when you have the inhibitor. This is a steady state accumulation. And then you can see the uptake being reduced in one of the mutant compared to your wild type. And then you, as we saw yesterday, you look at the binding of the IAP under cross-link conditions. And you, in wild-type protein, as expected, cyclosporin competes for the binding, but in the mutant, there is no effect of this. Um, uh, the cyclosporin is not able to inhibit the binding, which means you, when you make these three mutations, you make the change in the protein. Here it just shows that the ATPase activity is same, you know, with cisless protein or your mutant protein. So you're not affecting the ATPase activity, which is just affecting the binding site. And then here you are showing again with the expression, so that you know that the, if your mutations are affecting the expression, then you really cannot conclude anything from these studies. So you need to show that your mutant is expressed to the same level as your wild type. So these are some of the controls you have to use and then show the rhodamine transport that triple mutant is still able to transport rhodamine compared to like the cisless even though it's slightly less, okay? We discussed yesterday about ATP hydrolysis and effect of substrates that when you have the substrates binding into the ATP binding site, they have effect on ATP hydrolysis but when you take the protein without having any substrate, there is a basal ATPase activity. And here, as you can see, when you make the mutations in the drug binding pocket, although you are not changing the level, you can normalize the level of expression compared to wild type, you have varying degree of basal activity, showing that something in the drug binding pocket binds and stimulates the ATPase activity. Either there could be phospholipids or endogenous substrate which contributes the ATPase activity of these mutants and you have this variation. So we think that the basal ATP hydrolysis may be due to stimulation by an endogenous substrate or membrane lipids because lipids are also amphipathic and hydrophobic so they can act as pseudo substrate in membranes. This is just the effect of the different substrates and you can you know, look at the effects showing that this not change because of the mutations. So it shows that the con if you mutate these residues in the transmembrane domains at the predicted docking site, these are part of a common drug binding site for substances like cyclosporine or valinomycin because they don't inhibit IAP binding. But the common drug binding pocket sites are mutated, drug substrates or modulator actually bind to the alternate sites on the transporter. That's why you continue to get the transport because you now bind to the alternate site. And a large flexible binding pocket with multiple overlapping sites in PGP is able to bind dissimilar compounds through a versatile allocation of hydrogen bond donors and acceptors or hydrophobic residues. So what we have, the polyspecificity basically is due to the chemical or molecular and structural flexibility which contribute to the polyspecificity. That means you can have, you do not have rigid binding the way you have in enzymes where a specific lock and key model, you know, where you have the specific substrate binding and then interactions here, the substrates, if the original site is not available, you can bind to another site. And this is just schematically shown here. You can have two substrate binding sites for the same substrate. They can bind to the primary site and get transported 
or you can bind to the secondary site and get transported. But once you knock out one of the binding site with triple mutation, you still bind to the second site and you have transport. And that's the reason why you don't see difference because of the mutations. And earlier, actually, we had shown with the biochemical studies that, and also the mass spectrometry studies, that two molecules can bind into the binding pocket of pig like a protein. You can also show, I showed you the X-ray crystallography studies with mouse protein where you can have one to three molecules bound. So this is actually showing you that, yes, it's possible to bind two or three substrates at the same time in this uh, substrate. The another feature contributing to polyspecificity is the flexibility of the molecule. For some reason, these a the drug transporters have very high flexibility. So we, if you take the protein in membrane and you have two cysteine groups here, you can measure the distance between two cysteine groups by using bifunctional uh, reacting molecules. And that distance comes to about 20 to 25 angstroms between two ATP binding sites. But if you look at the crystal structures, this distance ranges from 38 angstroms to almost 53 angstroms. This is all under APO condition. You know, there is no substrate, there is no ATP. And so there is a wide variation of the distance between you know, the NBDs or ATP sites, showing you that this flexibility allows molecules to have this, you know, the binding pocket either small or big, depending on the size of substrate. So you can have the structural flexibility contributing to the polyspecificity. <laughs> Yes, so what you do is you, you select a location, like we, there are in Walker A region, there are two cysteines, native cysteines, and bifunctional groups you can you know, use, which are commercially available. And they have a linker of known size, distance. So if you have a linker, they range from 5, 5 angstrom to 25 angstrom. And only those with 20 to 25 angstrom would show you the cross-linking and you get a, you know, on a gel higher molecular weight, so you know what there is a cross-linking. And remaining cysteines are removed from the molecule, so there are no other contribution of cysteines. So you just have two cysteines here. And this is actually the same residues in the crystal structure, then you measure the distance in a structure by you know, just looking at the structure. And this is mouse pig like a protein, mouse pig like a protein. We also have the structure of C. elegans pig like a protein and you can see the differences. So you, one of them is chemical flexibility of the, your substrates because they can bind. The other one is the structural flexibility and then amino acid residues where all you can also have structural flexibility. And the way to look at this using the same cysteines, if you know the electron paramagnetic resonance, EPR studies you can do where you can use the spin label of your substrate and you have two cysteines. You can show here, you see that these are the residues which are you know, labeled with cysteine. There is a pair at different locations. And then there are different conditions. You can have the APO, there is a VRAP mill. AMP, PNP is a non hydrolyzable ATP analog, which means it can bind same as ATP, except it doesn't get hydrolyzed. Okay? ATP, you, ATP vanadate and X-ray, uh, which is the APO structure, so they are just comparing. And as you can see here, by looking at this distance, there is a, this double electron-electron resonance uh, EPR, which allows you to then measure the distance. These peaks, what you see, and the distance on the x-axis in Anstrons. And you can see that you know, there is a wide variation of distance. For example, this, you can have the distance ranging from like 40 Anstrons to 70 Anstrons. That's again showing you that there is a flexibility, but this is under APO condition. When it is hydrolyzing and when you trap the molecule with ADP vanadate, now you can see it shifts all the way to the left. And now you are, because it's coming closer, the distance is narrow. And this, these are the, you know, some of the biophysical techniques you can use to then look at also in these re regions what the flexibility is. And that's how we know these molecules are very flexible. Okay. And this is again shown 
uh, with summary with the, you know, this is the X-ray crystallography data showing two or three binding sites. These are the biochemical studies earlier done in 80s, 90s, people showed rhodamine site and hoax site. You may have seen a lot of papers with R and H site. But then this is the rhodamine B site with the mutations identified and then the verapamil site with additional mutations, which is now this question mark. So you can see here, at least you have three different sites where the substrates can bind. So you have multiple sites in the same pocket Okay. You can also look at by cryo EM, the cryo electron microscopy, uh, the conformations of protein on the different catalytic cycle. And um, this is just a technique where you, can, you have your purified protein in detergent solution. You make the grids and then cryo EM, you, you have the electron microscope where you can uh, take the signals and then you do the modeling. I'm not going to go with this. This is just to show that you, you have to use a fab antibody of um, antibody to which binds to the extracellular region. And these are the nucleotide binding domains. And then you can look at the conformations. Just focus on this. You, you have the closed conformation and open conformation, even though it's uh, open uh, in APO condition. So by using these criteria, you look at the conformation of pig like a protein under catalytic cycle where you don't have a ATP hydrolysis here, where you add ATP, even though it's a hydrolyzing ATP, you have open and closed conformation, which means it goes open and closed flexibility. But once you trap with vanadate, as you trap ADP, it all gets stuck in its closed conformation. And then when ADP is released, phosphate is released, you again have open confirmation with varying length and then you come to the cycle. So you can use different ways to study these um, confirmations. This is the same slide which I showed you yesterday that the substrate binding pocket substrates bind and then you have the effect on ATP hydrolysis that most substrates stimulate ATP hydrolysis. Now we'll come to the inhibitors we are talking about the inhibitors. We have three very high affinity inhibitors. Most substrates have affinity in micromolar concentrations, okay? Most transported substrates, whereas these are in nanomolar concentration. And so we would like to know what is the molecular mechanism, how we can look at this. And that's the question, how do drugs modulate ATP hydrolysis? So our hypothesis we came up with is that the compounds that bind tightly to pig like protein decrease the basal ATP, as hyd ATP hydrolysis and transport. And if you look at the non-covalent substrate modulator interactions, either there is a hydrogen bond, Van der Waals or pi cation interactions. So you can then look in the drug binding pocket and we selected three residues, two tyrosines and one glutamine, which has a possibility of forming hydrogen bond interactions. And then you ask a question, when you change your residues to alanine, because alanine is a very small amino acid which cannot form any uh, hydrogen bond interactions. It only has the Van der Waals interactions or you know, non-polar. And then you again express this protein in baccalaureus transduced HeLa cells and then look at what effect it has on ATP is activity. Now, the wild type protein, you see all the way, it inhibits the ATP hydrolysis. But when you just change three residues in the binding pocket, instead of now in inhibiting the activity, you stimulate the activity. So you totally change the whole behavior of the substrates, I mean these compounds. And this is not only for one compound, you have three of them, Zoscudar, Ilacridar, Terichidar, these are the structures. And then you look at kinetic parameters. You can calculate the IC50s. When you look at the stimulation, this is called concentration required for 50% stimulation is EC50. When you look at inhibition, it's IC50. So these, as you can see, these are nanomolar concentrations. But when you go to EC50, 
at least there is five to tenfold difference, which means you are changing the affinity from high affinity to low affinity just by changing three residues. And that's the feature which gives you insulop inhibition stimulation of the ATPase activity. So then you can go back to your in silico model and dock these substrates. When you dock the substrates, what we found that when you dock Zoskudar, there is actually the hydrogen bond formation with tyrosine 953. And this tyrosine is held in that position with this F978. So there are a lot of structures of proteins known where there is a T-shaped motif where tyrosine is held in T-shape with phenylalanine. And that's what you see here. And this is what we were able to identify by doing in silico analysis. Now, if you took, take electridar, you have more residues interacting. Now, in addition to the tri 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 tyrosine 953 and F 978, at the same symmetrical position on the N terminal half, you have tyrosine 310, F 728. You have the similar feature, and again, you have this hydrogen bond interactions. There is also possibility of this Q195 interacting with hydrogen bonds with these residues. Then when you move to Tarikidar, you have more complex interactions. With these two motifs, in addition, you have the residues. So you, you know, this is, then we went back, changed the tyrosine 310, and sure enough, we lost the interaction with Electridar, but had no effect on Zoskudar because T10 is not interacting with Zuskudar. Then we also looked at tyrosine 307. And we can show with the Tarikidar that it has an effect. And then the Q990 and Q195. So you go back to your, first you have the in silico analysis, you do your mutations, go back to your in silico and validate the model. So this is how you then look at your uh, interactions. So mutation of three polar residues of drug binding pocket, like tyrosine 307, Q725, and Y953, produces a switch from inhibition to stimulation due to hydrogen bond. Um, I mean, um, of the in, uh, stimulation of the basal activity. The hydrogen bond interaction seem to go on this inhibition of ATP hydrolysis. And then docking studies indicate phenylalanine. I, I told you about this T-shaped motif, which was not known earlier. We only came to know only we, when we mutated the tyrosine 953. And this is just when we look at screening modulators, always people look at stimulation of ATP hydrolysis. And now what we can show with these data, actually what you should be looking at really is a inhibitory effect you should look at the modulators which are inhibiting ATP hydrolysis because then they would be the high affinity inhibitors and rather than the so it will save a lot of time and uh, analysis and screening. So this was with the three residues mutated. So then we asked the question, obviously, you know, if the hydrogen bond interactions are important, what will happen if you take this drug binding pocket, okay? We know that there are a lot of phenylalanine residues in the drug binding pocket. So we decided to mutate 11 phenylalanine residues with tyrosine. Because structurally they are similar except the charge. Uh, you either have hydrophobic interaction or uh, hydrogen bond interaction. And so we decided to actually do what we termed as the global alteration of the drug binding pocket. Okay, so we selected 11 phenylalanine residues, two leucine, one isoleucine, and one methionine. And these are highly conserved in all P glycoproteins of mammalian species. So we will study, we'll know then what happens when we mutate these. And the mutant with 15 tyrosines, we called it 15Y because tyrosine is Y single letter. And these are the locations of these residues in wild type, and these are tyrosines. And this is the, lin, you know, the lateral view. As you can see, this is lining the pocket. And when you look through the bottom of the pocket, 
there is a whole cluster of tyrosines. And so we should be able to see now what effect it will have. So first of all, you need to look at the expression. Expression is normal. Even the mutant with 15 mutations is slightly higher. You look at the steady state transport of four different substrates. Okay. Three of them are normally transported. One of them is not transported. But then, yesterday I was discussing, telling you that there are 20 to 25 fluorescent substrates you can use to screen uh, the transport properties of mutants. And so here we have what 20 substrates. And as you can see, even when you make 15 changes in the drug binding pocket, it has no effect on the expression, no effect mostly on the function of the protein. So uh, that many changes are tolerated in the binding pocket. And that's the flexibility of the binding pocket, which leads to polyspecificity. But interestingly, what we found is not only that, but there are certain substrates are either transported poorly or their body pin blasting is not at all transported. So what is the feature? So one of the things we want to know is when you look at steady state accumulation, you are looking both at influx and efflux. But if you want to look at efflux alone, you can load cells with your drug under ATP depleted conditions and start doing efflux by following it. And when you do the efflux, you can see the NBD cyclosporinase efflux very well by wild type protein. But the mutant protein doesn't efflux any NBD cyclosporinase, showing that it's not transported. But the same thing with body pure mill, both are more or less equally transported. So this is positive control showing the effect is not major like just disrupting structure, but it's specific. Then we looked at all different properties of the, these substrates to see is there any correlation between the observed lack of transport of this, some substrate, but not all, and sure enough, you can see that this is the molecular weight in Daltons and the transport efficiency of the mutant. And these are all the substrates. Only substrates which are not transported are only the large molecular weight substrates, which are like from 1100 Daltons to almost 1400 Daltons. So by making 15 residue changes, only thing we are really altered is the transport of large molecules, but not the medium sized molecules are small molecules. So which tells you that the residues in the binding pocket have the ability to recognize the size of the molecule. Okay. So this is the conclusion of these studies that mutating 15 key residues uh, to tyrosine in the transmembrane region is well tolerated because the expression is normal and more or less the transport for most of the substrates. And then there is a negative correlation between the size and transport substrates by an efficiency of transport by the 15Y mutant. Three largest fluorescent substrates are not transported. And this is the first report to our knowledge that's showing that the roles of residues in the drug binding pocket in recognition of size of substrates. So if we are able to understand the mechanism, how they contribute, then you could look for the modulators of, let's say you can have a filter saying, okay, you should look at modulators which are above 1,000 Dalton or above 1,200 Daltons, and they should be then bypassed by the transporters. That's the kind of study then leads you to look at or set the parameters for further studies. Okay. So this has not been done with other transporters yet. But actually, nobody initially believed that you could make 15 changes in the drug binding pocket and still get the protein functional. We just wanted to use a broad, because so far, most of the poly, we'll see this on Thursday, polymorphic changes in pig like protein do not result in the loss of transport. This protein, the function is highly conserved throughout the changes. It, this is in all ethnic populations. So far, we haven't found any null mutant in patient populations where there's a loss of transport. Uh, so that's one of the things we wanted to see. What, it, what is it that makes the protein so um, you know, robust 
resistant to changes. And I think these are the, some of the answers we get, which is the, not only the chemical flexibility, but also the molecular flexibility of the transporters, giving you the polyspecificity. And now, in the, you know, obviously now the next step would be to find out of, of those 15, which are the residues contributing to size recognition, and then go from there to see, is that something we can increase the filter? Or can you do the reverse where you could now, you know, have some residues which made it also recognize the small size and block it, if that's possible? Okay.